when you find someone who doesn't punish you for saying what you want or who you are or what you need, there's such a joy around that. And I, I think if somebody would, ask, if somebody asked me, how would you describe your relationship? I would say joyful. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 158. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have a fun interview with Beatrice and Dante from the podcast Cheating on Fear. They're awesome. Yeah, no, it's an awesome, (laughs) it's an awesome interview. We're super excited to be getting it out there and to honestly be helping promote the work they're doing. They started their show uh, back, back in July. Yeah, back in July, as I said last week. No, nope. for, for I was I was right last week. Just excuse just, me. Just, excuse <laughs> me. Let's just make that known. <laughs> so yeah, that, um, it's an awesome show. Uh, we highly recommend checking it out, uh, especially last week's episode, which uh, Emma and I were on. Yes. So check that out. From December 2nd. December 2nd. So links are in the show notes uh, for you to go and see the work that they're putting together. Again, it's awesome. And the interview on our show here is awesome as well. Their story is fantastic and their approach is just wonderful. We had a lot of amazing conversations. So you're going to want to stay tuned, but we do have a couple of quick announcements. The first is a couple of shout outs. We just wanted to um, spread the message in the community that there's... Spread some love. Right. Share the love. The Share the Love event. <laughs> Share the Love event. We're probably going to get contacted by one of the car companies now. <laughs> um, but what I was saying was that we wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway, to cut to the point. Two shout outs for two blogs out there right now. Monogamous Marriage, who actually came on our show back at the very beginning. They're in episode 20, but they have an amazing blog all about uh, non-monogamy and their story. Yeah, and- they're they're monogamish. Right. Yeah. Bullshit. Anyway, <laughs> they're good friends of ours, good friends of the show. Uh, we highly recommend going and reading about everything that they've got out there. Also, I wouldn't steer clear of their Twitter account. <laughs> no. They, they both take very nice photos. They do. So they do. check that out while you're at it. Um, NSFW. Yes, uh, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> the second one uh, is a blog that actually is fairly recent, came out at the beginning or partway through the pandemic here, called Polly in Place. And actually, we've interviewed them, and their interview is coming out December 23rd. So we highly recommend checking that out. Uh, fantastic writing as well, and just lots of great stuff. So again, as Emma said, just wanted to share the love. <laughs> Share the love. And then a couple of community announcements. We have our next upcoming meet and greet this Saturday. That's December 12th. It's going to be from 10 p.m. till midnight Eastern time. We know that's late, but you can do it. It's a Saturday night. Come join us. Oh, pep talk. Yeah. (laughs) They are $10. They're open to anyone and everyone, and we would love to have you there. We're not going to talk much more about it because we had some of our previous attendees and amazing community members reach out and send us some little a little plug. So yes. we'll cut to that amazing it's that's awesome. Let's and, go to that. And we'll be back in a minute. Hey everyone, she's Allie. And he's just some dude. <laughs> And we're here to tell you how cool Emma and Finn are. Actually, more like to officially endorse their meet and greets and other events they host. We've met and greeted so many wonderful people. It's been a bright spot during COVID. Thanks, Finn and Emma. For creating this amazing community. In summary. Five stars. Highly recommend. So, if you're looking for fun. Lighthearted. Low pressure. COVID-friendly events. With like-minded people. Sign up. And and we'll we'll see you there. there. And we're back. We're back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fully, fully endorsed. Yes, I know. Five stars. By Allie and some dude. Five? (laughs) Hey, that's our highest rating ever. (laughs) It's pretty amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for sending that in. We really appreciate it. And for your incredibly kind words. And for making us sound bad in terms of our ability to do the handoffs. Their what? handoffs were butter. Oh, yeah, I know. They were smooth. Yeah, we, we got to work on our handoffs. We're not the best at those. 
Correct. <laughs> so as a reminder, you can sign up for our meet and greet this coming Saturday, December 12th at our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com by clicking on the meet and greet tab. We'll see you there. Uh, we are do have a couple of Patreon events coming up as well. These are separate. Um, we have a women's group call that's actually tonight. That's the 9th of December. But if you missed it, there'll be one in January. Don't worry. The men's group call on the 15th and then a Q&A on the 16th. So if you're interested in joining, we'll talk more about that in the outro. But you can find more information as well on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the Patreon button. Yeah, uh, sort of what Emma was saying is we're going to talk more about what all of that means in the outro. But really quick here in the intro just a huge wonderful thank you and shout out to everyone who's part of that community there's 140 members Yay. out there and it's super exciting so thank you to all of you who make that possible we appreciate it and now head over and let's talk to cheating on fear yes welcome to the show we're excited to have you both we're Having, we're having virgin mimosas because it's still a little early here on the East Coast. But You mean on the West Coast? On the West Coast, whatever. <laughs> I haven't woken up fully yet either. So. It's not that early. Yeah. Anyway, Dante, Beatrice, thank you so much for being here. We're super excited and we're excited about your show. We've listened to it a bit and it's fantastic. So, Thanks, guys. Thank, oh, thank you. Thank, thank you for being here. And Do you mind introducing yourselves for anyone who's not on the cheating on fear train yet? Yeah, go go ahead, Dante. All right, well, I'm I'm Dante, and I'm Beatrice, and and as you said, we record the Cheating on Fear podcast. Yeah, it's um, we're really excited to to be here because um, it was a delight to come across your your um your show and and your account. We kind of found our each other on Instagram. Yeah, right? yeah, and and it was nice to it was nice to to start to chat with you and and. And see what you guys were doing. You guys are way ahead of us, and it was really interesting to to listen to all the stories that that you guys get to hear from the different people that you talk to. And it was really interesting to hear your story because there were so many similarities to our story. We, I, we were listening to it in separate cars driving, and it was just like, yes, 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 like verbatim, yeah, like, like the exact. It's like it's like get out of my head. You you said yeah. literally word for word the same <laughs> yeah. thing. I have said. Yeah. So, um, so we, uh, it is primarily cheating on fear is primarily a sex and relationship podcast, but we do cover other topics, you know, things that people are, are maybe feeling a little bit trepidatious about like travel, um, like, um, you know, training, you know, we, we talk about, um, our last couple episodes ago, we talked about, um, women's self-defense and, and those kinds of things. So just, just, you know, um, cultural stuff and cultural things that are going on in addition to, um, sex and relationships and sometimes how they kind of intersect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it's been, yeah. it's been really, really fun. We're really enjoying doing it. And, um, meeting you guys is just one of the unexpected benefits of, of wading into this, into this world. So it's, we're really excited to be here today. Yes. It's, yeah. It's no. really cool. we're, we're super excited to have you. And it's a, it's a great community of, you know, podcasters and supportive community. So we, we hope. And listeners. And listeners, obviously. <laughs> but yeah. Thank you listeners. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, I mean, do you mind introducing like who, who are Beatrice and Dante and yeah. then maybe take us back to how, I mean, I, I know your story is basically our story. It sounds like, but yeah. But the listeners in, don't, they don't in, in broad strokes, yes. But. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we have listened to a little bit, so we know it's not a you're not gonna repeat everything we did. I I can guarantee that. <laughs> we made a lot of mistakes, so I don't think I'd want them to no, do that. No. <laughs> well, I mean, you guys you guys have been together a lot longer than we have, too. Yeah. So that you know I more think, room for error. Well, because you know, <laughs> when you're like I'm sure like when you're young and stupid, like you just do stupid shit. That's what happens. Yeah, that's yeah. part of being young, I think. Um so I am in my late forties and I, I was married for almost 13 years, just, just a couple of weeks shy of 13 years. Um, I have two adult sons and, um, I was raised Catholic. So I know that you had a guest a couple of weeks ago who had talked about, um, everything that goes along with being raised in a, uh, in a, with a religious background and the shame that that brings to sex in general. Um, 
especially for women. And so I kind of grew up with that. And so, you know, there were, it didn't stop me from doing a lot of stuff. (laughs) It just stopped me from talking about it. And, you know, very traditional um, relationships for most of my life. Um, Just, you know, a very, very rich fantasy life. And it was, it was kind of interesting because during my marriage, I, I experienced that sort of just complete zapping of my desire. And I, I mistakenly at that time thought, well, I, I guess that's just it. Like that I'm, I guess I'm done now. You know, I've had a couple of kids, I'm married, I'm working on a career, education, all those kinds of things. And we're just like, running this household now with these kids and doing all the things and looking perfect. And I just figured that part of my life was over until I got divorced. (laughs) And then it was like, Oh shit, maybe it's not over. (laughs) He got her groove back. Yeah. He got her groove back, I guess. Yeah. So, and, and it was, it was just really, really interesting. And even then, even after I first got divorced, I still had this feeling like, well, like who's going to want a 40 year old, divorced mother of two, like how, like, where am I going to find people to date or have sex with or whatever it was? Like it it was that, 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 that shame kind of came roaring back again, where it's like, well, you know, you've followed your vagina out of this marriage. What are you going to do now? You know, kind of thing. And so I dated a little bit and was like, oh, well, this is actually easier than I thought it was going to (laughs) be. And just not interested at all. I, I was in a relationship for a couple of years after my divorce. Like I said, kind of thinking like, this is my last shot at it. And it was, he was like a third child, like God love him, very lovely human being, but just not, not the intellectual challenge that I was looking for. You know, it was, it was like one of my best friends called him an adoring lap dog that I needed for a couple of years while I healed up, you know, <laughs> and you know, he lovely human being, but, um, by the time that was over, I was like, I'm done with relationships. I'm just going to date. And I think, you know, when people talk about solo poly, that was kind of what I was thinking was like, you know what, I'm just going to date people and everybody's just going to have to deal with whatever. And if you don't like it, that's fine. You don't have to date me, but I'm going to date several people. And just, I had a full life on my own. So it was just like, you know, I'd like to have dinner once in a while with someone or maybe go, you know, for a hike with someone once in a while and, and basically, and have sex. That would be awesome. Yeah. And then, uh, and then Dante showed up and threw a monkey wrench in my entire program. Program of the, the pro I was building a stable is what he wants me to say. (laughs) (laughs) I was building a stable of Dick. That's, that's what you want me to say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And just, you know, where I'm like, Oh, I'm going to take this one out today. I'm going to take that one out today. And he showed up and just, you know, blew that all to hell. So, and that was what, about three and a half years ago? Yeah. About three and a half years ago. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So that, that was my, that was my situation. And um, yeah. So how about you? Nice segue. Yeah. (laughs) Real real quick before you jump into Dante's side of the story, did you ever explore non-monogamy in your previous relationships or know anything about it? I didn't know anything about it. I knew about cheating. And I mean, that's, I, I didn't know it's, it's such a great question that you asked because I wish I'd known that there was another choice. And right. th- when I listened to you guys talk about your story, I was kind of, I don't, I don't usually envy, get envious about things, but I was just kind of like, wow, like I love that they've been doing this their entire dating lives basically. And I, I mean, I'm very happy to be where we are now. And I'm, I'm happy that, you know, I'm happy that I was at a stage emotionally and, and mentally that I could really be thoughtful about it and, and do the research and really be honest with myself about how I felt. But, um, I really didn't know that that was an option. Actually, I was just thinking, and you've, I've told you this story, Mm -hmm. um, right at the end of my, of my marriage, my, my now ex-husband, I was leaving for work. It was a, it it was a horrible time. It's a special kind of hell living with somebody that you're separated from. And you will attest to that. I'm sure when you tell your story, (laughs) but, um, I was leaving for work one morning and my ex said to me, so I think there's another way that we can do this. And I was like, all right. 
what? And he said, what if I gave you like one weekend a month, you could go and stay in a hotel and like, just do whatever you wanted to do one weekend a month. And I'm thinking, is he offering me like 12 annual hall passes to just do whatever? <laughs> and whomever I whomever you want. Yeah. Like a punch, and I a thought, punch card system. Yeah. And it's like, do I get an extra one for my birthday? Like, how does that work? And uh, I was, I remember being so like, well, we could do it your way and I could get one weekend a month or I could do it my way and get all of them. So I think I'm going to do it my way. But thank you for the offer. Because, you know, it wasn't just about sex. You know, like the breakdown of our relationship wasn't just about sex. But if it was, looking back now, it's like if if that was the only thing wrong, then, hey, you know what? Let's try that and see how that works. In my and in my situation, though, it that wasn't the only thing wrong. It was, you know, in that case, a symptom of a lot of other things that was wrong that were wrong. But uh, that was about the closest that I came to sort of touching on non-monogamy and 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 I think in in monogamy world, the hall pass is about the as far as people get with their discussions, right? Or the celebrity right. hall pass, the list, the laminated list, <laughs> right? So yeah. Yeah. yeah but, no, I thank but, you for sharing. And and I I I just had two questions. One was that you you had talked about you said you didn't really discover that you, you thought that part of you was dead, the sexual part or the, mm-hmm. that adventure. I thought my Yoni was, was dead. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Until after you got divorced. It sounds like you dis you had a little bit of an awakening before the divorce, and that was at least somewhat of the catalyst for the divorce. It wasn't like I got divorced and then I woke up the next day and realized I was horny. <laughs> Such a good question. <laughs> it is a good question. Um, I found myself attracted. I think once, once my brain had gone to, you don't have to do this anymore. You don't have to stay in this relationship anymore. Once my brain had gone there, that is a great question. Mm. Oh my God. I'm so impressed. Um, <laughs> that, I started to experience crushes on people again and started to find myself attracted to people and thinking about, Oh, what might that be like? And what? And so, yeah, I always had kind of a rich fantasy life, but they were always like made up people. Yeah. Right. And, and so once, once that shift started to take place, I, I, I think, yeah. And then I was like, Oh, maybe, I don't know. I'm starting to feel some tingling down there. Like maybe, maybe she's just sleeping. Maybe that's what it is. You it's know? almost so. like you gave yourself permission to, yeah. to open that side of yourself. And before you hadn't, because you're you know, in that mindset of, and you're in this relationship and it, you almost just get so focused on that, that you don't let, you don't give yourself permission to think about other things sometimes. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're right about that. And I think I was so afraid, like there was a few times in relationships when I was a teen that I did cheat on my partner. And I think I was afraid that if I acknowledged that I was still a very sexual being, that I would cheat on my husband. Mm-hmm. And it didn't even occur to me to go to him and say, Hey, cause I didn't know. So I think I was just kind of, you know, the relationship tamped all of that down. And my fear of being, my fear of being a, a, a cheating wife tamped that down. And then right. you're right. Like after, when you start to give yourself permission to feel the way you feel and be who you are. And that was one of the huge things about meeting Dante was immediately after I met him, I felt like this was someone that I could express myself fully in a sexual way, in an intellectual way, in an emotional way. And it was, that was just something that I did not see coming at all. So yeah. Yeah. A little foreshadowing mm. for you. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> you had a second yeah, question. My, and, oh, and, I'm and, sorry. Question. No, you're fine. No, it's, for, it's wonderful. And I think the second question was just when you were building your stable, uh-huh. um, <laughs> did you, did you apply any of the, had you like started researching? Cause you mentioned solo poly. You, had you started applying those terms or that mentality or was it just like the thing I'm going to do is go out with who I want to go out with when I want to go out with them and and that's just the way I'm going to do it there was no you know quote unquote structure around it no there there was no structure I I I think retroactively I look at what I was doing was kind of solo poly but the idea was that and and this is the thing being in my mid-40s at that time at that point 
I didn't feel like what I did, unless I was in a committed relationship with someone, that anything that I did when I wasn't with them was really none of their business. Mm-hmm. And and the relationships were very, they were mostly physical relationships. I I am a connection person, so I I have to like you to to take my clothes off and get naked with you and have sex with you. And no shade on anybody who enjoys anonymous sex, because I think there's lots of people that do that. And I understand the excitement of that. But for me, if I'm not interested in you, I'm not interested in your dick either. So they weren't like completely devoid of, of connection, but, but as far as them in a position where they could ask me, well, where were you last night? That was not, that was just not part of the deal. It's not, yeah. No, you're, <laughs> That was a question that you would never ask me. Um, so, so yeah, I think just looking back on it now that, that looks like, and, and I didn't, I wish I'd had the language, you know, I, right. uh, you, there's, there is very much, there is a language to all of this and I wish I knew how to express myself a little bit better, but it, it honestly never came up. Like th- these men, the men that I would date were a lot younger than me and, they kind of like, I think in a certain way, they knew what it was just by virtue of the age difference between us, because it's like, you know, we're not going to get married. You know, we're not going to have, you know, we're not going to do all We're not going to do the dance. So we all know what this is. So know your place kind of thing. Right. That sounds really harsh. Doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. Yeah, that's okay. But that's the way it was. That's how I yeah. was. Yeah. You know, what's, that, what's that Rihanna song? Needed me. Yeah. Yeah. And the opening lyric, you know, I was good on my own. That's the way it was. Yeah. And I was like, that, that was my theme song. That was my walkout song for like yeah. ages. Right. And, she, and own it like that. That's Emma, really, Emma knows I, what I'm talking about. She knows what song <laughs> I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's my little, yeah. It's my little theme song. So. Yeah. And and then Dante crashes into the stable and. Oh yeah. yeah maybe segue. we should hear your, your, your side of the story. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm Dante. I'm in my early 40s. Actually, I'm in my uh, late early 40s now. <laughs> um, I like that. I like to I like drag that. it out as long as I can, too. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm not solidly in my mid 40s for like another year, two years. Yeah. So um, I was married. I was in a, a, a long relationship. I, my ex wife and I were married for a little over 13 years, but we had been together when we separated 22 or 23 years. Yeah. So a long time. Um, Mm -hmm. And I didn't, as it turns out, didn't really know who I was 23, you know, plus years prior, right? Like you change, you grow. That's pretty normal. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And, and everything seemed to be okay up until I mean, so I, I lived abroad for school and did research in Latin America. And so I was gone for a year, um, leading up to the, my marriage, my first marriage. But we had, how many of you had? Well, just one so far. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, didn't you, didn't you hear she's not doing the dance again, Don? She's not. <laughs> so, Pay but it, but it had been a couple of years since we had, because of circumstance, my ex and I, we had spent a lot of time together. So it was, it was a year in another country, but it was like at the end of two or three years of really just sporadically being able to be in the same place. And I cheated on her bef- like two or three, we- at the end of the year, basically a couple of weeks before going back home and, and getting married and felt awful about it. Just, you know, had like white knuckled it for a year and then I'm about to like go home and then I do this thing and I'm like, I felt like tell, a che- cheating piece of shit. You should tell that story. Like, tell, like give them the details on how that went. Like you were out with, wasn't it like a going away party so, for you? So, I mean, you guys have traveled in South America. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure you came across expats when you were, uh, when you were there and where I was yeah. in South America, there was a community of expats and, and we'd get together every week. And like, as somebody like my background is not Spanish. I speak Spanish fluently now from all the time I've spent in Latin America, but you know, at the time I was still learning and it's hard to be like when you guys were doing your immersion and stuff, like you're like brain tired, just trying to think until you can get to a point in your language where you can think in that language and you can joke and you can be your 
personality in your native language in that other language, it's really, really difficult. And so these times were really important to just be able to kick back with, you know, Canadians and Americans and Europeans and things like that, and just be able to talk about things culturally that were and speak, speak English. Yeah, and, and you don't like have to you, think about everything. Yeah, you said. give, yeah. Your, give yeah. your brain a break. Yeah, and and there was a place in in the in the city that I lived in that was like one of these gathering spots for for expats to go, and it was a couple of weeks before I was leaving, and we were going out for a night basically, and the city I lived in in that country is reputed for being like the party place. So you could go to the strip on the beach and there's like 30 different nightclubs and you could just all the different types of music, whatever. And we're out there and everybody was feeling good and things were going great. And there was this kind of like mentality amongst these, these other guys. It's like, Oh, you're getting married soon. Like, you know, one more, you know, one more pussy for the rest of your life. Like you better get that shit sorted out now, you know, while you're away and everything's like, you know, no impact, just, and, and they kind of goaded me along and I guess like for a while. And at that point I was kind of like, I don't know, maybe I was drunk enough or, or whatever. I was just like, oh, okay, like fine. And so hooked up with this, with this, with this woman. And afterwards I'm walking back to my place and I'm just like, I felt horrible, like just terrible. I'd never done anything like that before to my ex I, like it had never even crossed my mind to do anything like that and then i had done it and like there are these like tractor trailers speeding by and i was like i'm just gonna take a step to the right and just this whole feeling of guilt all of this will just go away and i didn't but it was the one and only time in my life where i've ever been like that's a solution to this problem that i could just like and be done with it right and so i I'm feeling terrible for these couple of weeks before going home. And the advice I got from one of the, one of my, one of my friends there was like, do you, do you love this woman? The woman I was about to marry. And I was like, yeah, I do. Like really do. I've been with her for like nine years at this point. You know, we have this shared history. We've grown up together, all this sort of stuff. And he's like, then don't tell her. I'm like, that's what? Like, he's like, don't tell her because all you're going to do. And such wise words from this, like, early 20 something American kid. He's like, cause all you're going to do is make you feel better and make her feel like shit. Cause she's going to know what happened and her whole perception of everything is going to change. If you want to continue on in that relationship, you need to just take that shit and stuff it down in the memory hole and never speak of it again. And I couldn't do that. And so when I got home, I told her like two weeks before the wedding um that like this is what had happened and I'm sorry it's not funny but it's like, not I mean it, it's it's his advice was spot on and and I should have just kept that shit to myself and the consequence of that we ended up getting married anyways and the consequence of that is that the entire relationship there was this imbalance in the relationship I was always making up for something I had done 10 12 13 years in the past and I had kind of been forgiven, but it was always held over me as uh, a problem in, in the relationship. Anytime anything went wrong, it was always like, well, you know, and this happened and, and, and I, and I, and we got married. So you need to be more grateful or thankful or thoughtful or whatever. And it wasn't ideal. And then fast forward many years later in the relationship, my ex and I are on a holiday and we had a threesome and it was a, planned threesome it wasn't just like I, do, I just want i just want okay. to jump it sorry i didn't don't mean to interrupt right. you, but i just want to say like that was enough where you were like i will never do this again oh yeah like and you were you didn't it like, was nine years later yeah so like yeah. And, and you didn't even nope. think about it you uh -uh. were just like nope i'm i'm good right mm -hmm. yeah okay sorry i just yeah, want to make I, that clear I, and, yeah. and i just wanted to pile on a little bit and just say that like <laughs> The way you said that, that means that no, you're going to say something negative. No, no, not at all. I think the... I don't you know. know Pylon sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's true. Now, nine years later, it sounds okay. Yeah. No, um, that like the mentality, and I'm sure there was people listening that were like, you have to tell. And I'm sure there's other people who are like, yeah, definitely don't tell. Right. And I think that's a really hard position because you, you know, you were faithful for nine years and then you had one mistake mm -hmm. and then you were faithful for another nine, whatever, nine, 13 years, however many more years it was. And then, and it's this mentality and, you know, we quote Dan Savage probably a little too much, but that like, Never. there's Wait. nothing, 
there's nothing else in life that if you mess up one time in 10 years or 20 years or 80 years, that you immediately become a failure at it. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's just, you know, for you to take that and, you know, the, maybe the right solution was to like, I made a mistake. I'm not going to make that mistake again. I'm not, I'm not like cheating on her every week and like ruining her life behind her back. So maybe it was right. The best choice would have just been to like, keep it quiet and move on and you deal, you have to deal with it yourself, but you're not burdening her with that information. No, if, if I had, if I had known what I know now, I would have not said anything and dealt with my own issues around that guilt by like going to a therapist or like something like that and, and, and get that process of like unburdening myself without then transferring that burden on my ex. Right. That would have been because it completely, even though I'm the exact same person I was before that happened and that, that she had known for the entirety of our relationship, that, that act had irrevocably changed her opinion of who I was. And even to this day, she, she had never been able to reconcile that. Right. Right. And so, yeah. Yeah. All right. So so, nine years later, so nine years later, yeah. So we had a threesome and it was very, very strange for me. I mean, the threesome was fine. It was, you know, a little awkward as, as these things can be. And the thing that I remember the most afterwards was that my thing from like nine years prior was that it was a mistake. And at that time, I know it didn't change how I felt about my ex. But now when this was like, there was no shame or guilt around having sex with somebody else, I was worried like, oh, like, oh my God, like, am I going to fall in love with this other woman? And I'm not going to feel the same about about my wife like and and it didn't and i was like oh hang on a second like this is not what i expected like i thought that and and so it led me on this kind of journey of because i'm a scientist so i wanted to research what's going on like first of all after that my sex drive i didn't realize it had kind of tanked and i know now what that what that was you know like having a long-term relationship it, for men tends to tank testosterone levels. And one of the best ways to get your testosterone levels back up is to have a novel sort of like a relationship or encounter or something like that. And this had done that. And it got to the point where I like, I was so revved up all the time that I went to my doctor and I was like, I think I might have like a brain tumor or something. <laughs> Cause this is like, like this is what's happening to me. And, and he explained this to me and I was like, really like, and he's like, yeah, the, now what he, he couldn't tell me was how do you deal with this now? Like if your partner is all, all like cool, but I think my ex was experiencing what B experienced, like being in this long-term relationship, her desire. I mean, Dr. Wednesday Martin did an amazing book untrue where she talks about female desire and what happens in long-term relationships and stuff. And so I think it was this combination of that, like, you know, her libido had, had tanked and, and my libido had tanked and, and you know, we were in the process, like, having kids and raising children, like small children. So there's all these other kind of distractions in your life that you can kind of um, not really pay attention to it until something like this happens and you go, Oh, wait a minute. Um, so I read, I read tons of books. That was when I actually found Dan Savage and I started listening to Savage Love. And on one of his episodes, he interviewed Christopher Ryan, who mm-hmm. wrote the, uh, in my opinion, this uh, an amazing book called Sex at Dawn. And I read Sex at Dawn my background is in anthropology. And so it, it was, it, 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 as a social scientist, I could, and as a primatologist, I could understand a lot of the research that he was touching on in that. And I was like, there was just light bulb moment after light bulb moment after light bulb moment. I was like, there's nothing wrong with me. This is what happened. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a, there are societal kind of cultural, um, construct here and you know in north america doesn't jive with our biological evolution of hundreds of thousands of years like just all of these things coming together and and it just it started me on this whole path and finding all these different sex and relationship podcasts and and doing all this stuff so i i had been like reading and researching for a while after that 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 threesome had happened and then I got to this point where I had opened these conversations up with my ex 
not as plainly as I probably should have, but just kind of like, hey, I, this podcast is kind of cool. You should listen to this. Or I'm reading this really interesting book and, and all this kind of stuff. And she had no interest in, in this at all. And you brought up Dan Savage and uh, we quote him a lot too. And he talks about doing what you need to do to stay sane and to stay married. And that's basically what I did. And so for a period of a couple of years after that, that threesome, I had a variety of like different indiscretions and I always kept it in a way to protect my family and my home life, you know, making sure that there would be no way that this would kind of enter into that sphere. So everything from making sure I was in like a different geographical location to always making sure that it was safe play so that I was never putting anybody else's health at risk or anything like that. And it came out again that this had happened and and this time she was a lot less forgiving and understanding about what had happened. And that led to some like workshops and counseling and, and things like that. And it all kind of came to a head where non-monogamy became like, all right, well, like you don't want to do these things. You don't want to have sex with me, but I am still alive and still wanted to do this. So let's, let's just have an open marriage. And it wasn't the right way to approach it. It was like a band aid on a bullet wound. Like it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't set up for success. Right. Because there was all this baggage that was being brought along. And so it was very easy for feelings to get hurt. And, and it sounds like she wasn't necessarily, I don't want to speak for her, but she wasn't necessarily bought into it a hundred percent. Oh, she bought into it. Well, once it happened, <laughs> because, you know, like as Dr. Martin says, like, you know, her desire had tanked and then she started to have these experiences and, oh, it turns out that it, it, oh, like I remember having this realization and being like, oh, it's not that she doesn't want to have sex. It's that she doesn't want to fuck me anymore. Like that's, that's the issue because if it was somebody else, she was, you know, as a woman on, on dating sites, it's very easy to find, to find what you want. And she found it. And I just wanted to break in because, and I, I don't want to speak for her either, but I, I have spoken, I have had conversations with her and like subsequently. And I, I know a lot about how all of that went down and be, and it was almost like, I mean, you acknowledge that it, it wasn't kind of healthy going into it. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was she found a way to use this open marriage as a way to clobber you over the head with how things, there was a different, you've talked about rules. A lot of people talk about rules. She would arbitrarily make and break and recreate and change rules based on her comfort level and how she wanted him to behave. Right. So she'd make rules for him. And then there were rules between the two of them and she would break those and go, well, you cheated. So that's what we're doing. And it was just another layer of dysfunction on top of all the other shit that on, had gone down. Um, so it was very like, um, I think I, I'm not sure where I came into this. I know that's where you're going. I, next, but, I have it. Like, but, right here. and I don't, I hate to keep interrupting you, but sometimes <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm detail oriented. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I think that that was kind of a, a, and he kind of felt like, well, like I'm still getting to do this thing. So I'm just going to, okay. Like whatever, whatever you want, because I think you were still feeling kind of shitty about how things had gone down and you were just like, well, and you were genuine. I, I think you were genuinely happy for her that she was having good experiences and yeah. enjoying herself. Yeah, because it was, it was, this was somebody I cared about a lot. And as the mother of my children, I still care about in a, in a certain way. And I, I, all I wanted was for both of us to be happy. And I thought that this was one way that, that kind of, we could do that. Right. And we could still, because we were good parents and we had a nice life and, you know, our children were and still are amazing. But there was just this like portion of it. And it was like, why blow up everything when we can just do this? portion of our life a little differently than, than, than other people. So one of those rules, thank you for bringing them up, was that I was only allowed to play, um, I'm using air quotes, when uh, I wasn't, because I travel a lot for work. So the whole thing was that I wasn't allowed to play in like the city that we lived in, but when I was traveling for business and I could set things up. I too am not somebody who prefers to do like random hookups 
which makes it hard when I'm only in a city for a little while. Like that's really one of the only options that, that's available. And so I was about to leave on a trip and I was setting up a dating profile on like a mainstream, you know, swipe. I think, I think you're allowed to say. Bumble. All right. So I was on yeah, Bumble. You yeah. You can say anything you want. <laughs> yeah, yes. Are they going to sue us? I don't know. And so, so I was setting up a Bumble, a, a profile on Bumble because I was going to be going away and I meant to like, like hide it or pause it or whatever. So I set it up and then I was supposed to pause it and then like go to sleep and get on the plane and fly to the West coast the next day. And I didn't, I forgot to, I don't know, on purpose or by accident, I, I can't say. And in the, like literally the few hours between me sending it up and then waking up early, early in the morning to go to the airport to do this, this cross country flight, I had matched with B and we had had this awesome conversation and basically I was gone for two weeks and we chatted nonstop for that, the entirety of the two weeks. I rolled out my situation fair. I mean, Bumble's not like the apps that are meant for people who are in open or non-monogamous relationships, any kind of non-traditional type relationship. It's meant more for people like you meet one person and whatever. So I wanted to be, is this fine balance between like rolling out that information, uh, um, at an appropriate time, but not doing it too late where the person is invested in this information is going to change things. So, so I, was just, I, I don't know, women's situation might be a little different, but for guys, it's, it, it, yeah, it's a little bit trickier. So I rolled it out and B was like, that works Welcome for me. Welcome to the stable. I have a yeah. stable. There's a, there's a stall right here for you. I have an open stall. It's freshly mucked. Yeah. There you go. So, so we, we set up, we, we chatted virtually because we, B didn't want to have a conversation like a, like a video call or a phone call until we could meet in person. Um, so we talked all the time, about all sorts of things. And I don't know if this was like the first time that you had encountered anybody that was in my kind of situation. Yeah. You, you were the first. One. So when the two weeks were up and I was back in, in the area, we went out on our, on our first date and it was like, lightning and firecrackers and it was it was everything i couldn't have hoped for it to go as well as it did and it exceeded any kind of expectations i had had of what it was going to be like to be with to be with someone and at the time in my head i was kind of like this is perfect i have this amazing intellectual and physical chemistry with b so they're like you know that that itch is like scratched and i can have that home life with my wife and my children and, and those things just stay separate. And at the time I had thought that like a poly sort of situation was like the, the, what I wanted and, and what I was hoping to achieve. And then it became very, very clear, very, very quickly that it wasn't going to be possible for me and B to keep a distant relationship. I, I don't know. I won't speak for you on this, but well, I wanted more from the relationship with B not that we had to move in and get married or do any of that kind of stuff. But the idea of like seeing her like, like once a month was not going to be okay for me. And my ex probably could see what was going on. Maybe it was, you know, NRE new relationship energy or whatever it was, but you could see that I was really digging B and her reaction. Yeah. was to basically like close it down. Um, instead like she could have gone one of two ways and like embrace it and be happy or do everything she could to shut it down because she saw it as a threat and kind of, she went the latter. Well, and technically you were breaking a rule, right? Cause you were seeing someone locally. Yes. Which she was okay with but, because but, I was far enough away that she, yeah. she, she was okay with it. It was because you asked if it was yes. like, yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, that. I cleared our first date mm -hmm. with her before it happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and her justification for dating locally was that she didn't travel. And so therefore the only way that it was going to work for her is if she could see somebody that was down the street or whatever. And that had its own kind of complications that, that went with. And I think she was worried about you being on the dating apps when you were home and people seeing, and people seeing yeah. him. Right? Yeah, so that makes sense. It wasn't so much about, you know, and, and like I say, I was far enough away. Like we live, we live about 90 minutes away from each other on a highway. Like it's far. So the chances of anybody of us running into anyone and going, I saw yeah, your husband with this person. Like I, you know, um, 
that that wasn't an issue. So that was far enough away for mm-hmm. her. Yeah. Right. But yeah. Yeah. So she, so she kind of shut it down and I guess maybe, maybe take us to how you and B came to be what you are, maybe what you are today. And then take us through that a little bit. All right. Do you want me to? Yeah. Why don't you take over? It's been me talking for a bit. You, you, well, Dante, really, you know what's up. <laughs> well, really quick, Dante did. So I assume you said that she kind of wanted to shut that down and maybe quickly, like I'm guessing there was like pushback and you didn't want to do that. Yeah, pretty much. I, I, I wanted to respect her feelings and we talked about what the issues were around it. And we were able to come to an understanding that both things could exist at the same time. And that allowed things to continue on with B and I, because we had a veto rule, which I know a lot of people who do non-monogamy have, and I never exercised that power, but she was very quick to exercise it whenever she felt uncomfortable for whatever reason, it was like, well, no, you can't do that again. And it was actually funny that when B and I were, um, were becoming more serious, somebody that I wasn't allowed to see that, that had been vetoed in another part of the country, all of a sudden became an option again. It was like, why don't you go see this person that I told you you couldn't see? Maybe that'll take your mind off of, you know, all this nonsense with B or whatever. <laughs> So, so it was yeah. very flexible to suit the situation, which I didn't appreciate the, what I felt was like an emotional manipulation. And I didn't appreciate that. I didn't appreciate a double standard in terms of conduct of what I was being held to and what my ex didn't feel like she needed to meet. Mm-hmm. And I can understand and I can see it now with some distance. I can see what it must have been like for her to see this going on. Um, and I had hoped that our history together would have engendered a little bit more compassion about the situation and realized that like, there are things in our relationship that weren't working and that we were incompatible about. And instead of like holding on so tight that, you know, like just, you know, squeezing the kitten to death, um, opening up and just kind of releasing and being like, okay, like, let's figure out a way to like, this isn't going to work like this. So let's figure out a way to um, separate amicably and, and find each other's happiness so that, you know, we can continue to be good parents and co-parents and stuff like that. So we got to the point, we got to that point with, with, with my relationship with B where I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't want these restrictions anymore. And it had come at the end of like an escalation of things with my ex that were, I call it emotional terrorism. Just thing, just manipulations and, and, and thing that I just, and, and in B, I saw, I saw, I mean, this is the thing, like I had been with my ex for so long, like at this point, over two decades that I didn't understand. Like when you meet somebody, when you're a teenager, your emotional maturity is at one level. And hopefully as you get, you mature, your emotional maturity matures with you. But I, I like my experience with dating had been dating as a teenager and then I had gotten with my ex and we had been together and all of those things. So I didn't understand things in our relationship that the, to an outsider would look really strange and weird and not acceptable. They were just, I was just, I thought that's how relationships were. And then I, I meet B and I see in her as a woman, a completely different sort of reaction, mindset, um, emotional intelligence intellectual ability, just all these different things. And I was like, oh shit, I don't have to keep banging my head against this wall over here. There's another way. And there's another way to have a relationship with somebody that can be healthy and fulfilling and, and challenging and all, in all the right ways. And when I was faced with those kind of two options of like not having a relationship with B anymore to try and salvage what was left of my marriage or ultimately opting to end my marriage um, in, in the hopes that there was something better out there, whether it was with B or, or with someone else. I just, I knew that in my relationship with B, I just knew that there was some, there was another way and whether it was with B forever or for however long, it didn't really matter to me just that the, the knowing something else was out there was the important part. And that I wasn't going to keep doing that other thing anymore 
because it wasn't healthy and it wasn't productive and it wasn't good for me or my ex or your kids or, or my kids. And that was the other thing too, is I didn't want, you know, I didn't want my kids to look at the relationship with their parents as the way a healthy relationship is supposed to be. I didn't want them to grow up thinking like that is the way that anger and that, that hurt feelings and all that, like that was normal, which it, it isn't right. I want it to be a good model of a relationship um, for them. And I wanted, I wanted, cause I have both boys and girls, sorry, one girl and two boys. And, and I wanted them both because they're really, you know, roles and relationships differ depending on, you know, if you're a boy or a girl or whatever, but I just wanted them to know that like, it wasn't okay to accept emotional sort of terrorism. I also didn't, I wanted them to also prioritize their happiness as well and not to be hurtful to the other party, but to be able to find a way to do that. And, and the relationship with B was kind of all of those things wrapped up for me. And I want to make it clear that I did communicate with yep. your wife at the time and I reassured her at the time, you know, as things were starting to escalate, that I was not a threat to her, that I was, I was not out to take him from her, that I wanted to try and find a middle ground where everybody felt comfortable. And, and I encouraged you to mm -hmm. like, we stopped seeing each other for, for a period of time. So that he could, um, like take that stressor off the relationship. Yeah. And just, and just say, okay, that. let's, let's put a pin in that and, and try and figure things out. And ultimately it just got to a point where it just wasn't going to work between them. And, and I, I felt that that was an important thing to do. I never wanted to feel like I, I, I mean, there's that, like that home wrecker <laughs> name, right? That, that label. And I never wanted, his children to feel that way. I never wanted his family to feel that way or, and, and I wanted to, you know, a lot of times there's, there's a lot of, there's so many hurt feelings that nobody wants to communicate. And even at that time, I felt that it was important to communicate with her and tell her, this is not, this is not what I'm here to do. You know, I, I'm not, I don't, you guys need to work your stuff out. And when it became very clear that that wasn't going to happen, then it was time for, Dante and I to have a conversation about, well, okay, if I'm going to shut the stable down and we're going to talk about a relationship with us, what does that look like? And because he had come from an open marriage and I was kind of coming from what I retroactively call a solo poly situation, what does a committed relationship between us look like now? Because it wasn't an option. It wasn't something we'd ever discussed no. when we were getting together because there were, I was in a marriage and she had a stable and so like, but now all of a sudden things could change and did we want it to change? And what did that look like if we wanted to do that? So Dante informed me that he was going to be going away, um, for work uh, on a project for about six weeks. And it was pretty much my whole summer. And we had talked about like, what are we going to do about this? I think, you know, since we're fairly new, let's try, which we talked about, we talk about now as playing a part where, you know, I didn't want him to go without sex for six weeks. He didn't want me to go without sex for six weeks. And so we agreed that, you know, we talked about it and talked about it and talked about it and talked about some rules. And I think even at, for, for somebody like me who is very, very new to this, I think our rules were pretty minimal. It was essentially safer sex at all times. Yeah, safety first. And, you know, there were a couple of things that, a couple of acts and, and variety, like a couple of things that we had agreed we were only going to do with each other, things mm -hmm. that we were keeping just between us. Right. Yeah. And at this point, Dante, your marriage had ended. Like now you're, you had moving into more of a, a different type of relationship with the two of you. Yeah. So I, um, was separated from my ex and, but because of financial considerations, we were still living in the same house and, and lived there for two more years after that separation. Yeah. Which wasn't fun. <laughs> it was okay at the beginning and it got bad quickly. And then it was just kind of, but yeah. you guys did it for the kids and, and that was and, it. I, and, I, and, and you were giving her an opportunity to, you know, get some things set up for herself financially. And yeah, I and wanted that, to give her a was, chance that that all came from a good place. That yeah. was just to make sure everybody was okay. That was, the I thought it was going to be easier for my kids to stay in one spot and for my ex and I to kind of come in and out of the household rather than have them shuttling. Cause they were still quite small back and mm -hmm. forth between two households. And like you said, to give my ex time to get herself set up 
and figure herself out in and, and whatever heal. this, yeah, and, and to heal over all of this. Unfortunately, being sharing a space made that I think that retarded it a little bit. It didn't, mm-hmm. it didn't, it didn't make it possible. I think, I think in hindsight, making that not two years, something much shorter than two years would have been better, <laughs> but right. yeah, you can't change that. That's the way it yeah. is. Well, it's, so we, it's interesting. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No. Um, so we, we were going away for. Let him talk. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. No, okay. You're, I, no, so, so it's interesting though, that like you, your relationship started in basically a non-monogamous fashion, right? Mm-hmm. You were both ethically seeing other people mm-hmm. and doing that. But when, when this trip to South America comes along, you're, you're still having to renegotiate because it, it was still something different for you, which is, I think it's very interesting that like people would be like, oh, well, you have your stable and you've, you know, you've had a system and that system was in both of your prior systems weren't in place while you were together, but you now still have to renegotiate. Because now this is a different dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. Because now we had at the time when there was these things happening, we weren't in. I mean, we had always had a connection, mm-hmm. but we hadn't tested that connection. Yeah. And, and it was, I mean, I, I had fallen in love with B very hard and very quickly. And that was something that was totally, that was something that was totally different than any of the other kind of encounters that had same thing. You want to like them and all of that. Right. Or that's the way I prefer to to do it, but it didn't like, I didn't need to love everybody that I was. And that was actually a big realization for me, separating sex and love because up until that threesome, I had only had sex with somebody that I was in love with. I had never had casual sort of sex like that. And then when I realized that it was possible to do that, it was kind of, it was a little, well, especially because the one, right? right. The one time you had, when you had cheated, it, yeah. like before you got married, that messed you up. So, and gave you yeah. so much shame and guilt that you, exactly. you, you, it was, you made it even harder to separate those two. Yeah. Things and then when it comes to this time where B and I are going to be apart, um, having that experience prior that we had both had, it was kind of like, okay, we know we can, you know, on the one hand, we, we know we can do this. No, because we both, while we, while we were in our other containers where I had my stable and he was still in, in an open marriage, we both had sex with other people while we were doing that. Mm-hmm. And not just your wife. Like no. there were, other, so, so we knew that already. Wait, you had sex with my wife? <laughs> Stop. I was going to say, that would be the twist that we didn't have here. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a, that was a suggestion that came up in their, one of their therapy sessions, by the way. And I was like. That's a hard no. My counselor was like, here's, let me just hang just on a second. Falling. Let's just throw an idea out there. Why don't you have a threesome with both of them? And I was like, that's a bad And idea. bring back the girl from the original cheese. <laughs> too. Throw her back in and see maybe. Yeah, yeah let's, oh, let's do bad that. Idea, exposure Jean. therapy. Oh it's exposure yeah, therapy there you for go. your wife. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> just complete desensitization. <laughs> oh. And and so, but, but again, it's so interesting. And I know a lot of... Uh, a lot of stories are basically, I, I feel like it would be extremely difficult. And this is why I understand, you know, kind of where your ex is coming from to, to take a relationship that has been monogamous for a long time and try to crack that open. That must be in, incredibly t- hard and scary. Mm. Um, so for us, it was different because it was like, well, we haven't been together that long. Uh, I mean, and, and yeah, we've, we've sort of been, been in this, you know, type of relationship, but I really wasn't paying much attention to what he was doing on his own, or he wasn't paying a lot of attention to what I was doing on my own. But now we're in this different, and I, I know like you hate this word, but this other container and all of a sudden your brain is like, well, how long is it going to be? How long is it going to be till you find somebody to play with? How long is it? What am, who am I going to play with? Like, what am I going to do? And and it all of a sudden it, it, it changes it, that, that mind shift changes really, really quickly. But I think we were both anxious to try it out as soon as possible, just to see like, and I, I think we were both kind of interested. Is this just NRE? Is this just because it's new and because it's, you know, or is this, is this connection really as multi-leveled and multi-layered and strong as we think it is. And so we got to test that very, very early Mm -hmm. in our relationship. And um, just the way it worked out, 
he had a date on one night and then I had a date the very next night. And I was so stupid. I had originally wanted a DADT set up. Don't ask, don't tell. I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know anything. We would talk about it later. And it was- And this was for that six weeks. For that six weeks. And it was awful because he felt like he was lying to me all the time. And the problem was, I know when he's lying- (laughs) And then I'd be like, you have a date. Don't you? like, he was telling me about this beach that he went to. They were, and he was looking for flamingos. No, there was no, fl- and I was like, you didn't go to that beach by yourself, did you? And he was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so then we had, to, but it was better because then we got to talk about all these things. And I said, you know what? It's fine. Go, go have fun and go do what you want to do. And I got off the phone with him and you have to understand, like, he's like, like- two, two continents away. Or one, were you like one, two, 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 continents. two continents away and I'm missing him terribly and it's new. And, and now, now I've hung up the phone feeling good about the fact that I've been able to dig deep and make him feel good about doing what he's doing and enjoying himself. And I'm just like, oh my God, how am I going to sleep? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Knowing in real time, I've never experienced that in my whole life. How am I going to deal with that? And I thought, just go to bed. Just, just, just go to bed. Go to bed, and you'll wake up the next morning, and it'll be all over, and you can talk about it, and it'll be fine. And my scumbag brain <laughs> woke me out of a dead sleep at one in the morning. Yeah, and you were two hours behind me. Yeah, it was eleven p.m. And he had said, "I will message you when I get back." And it was one in the morning for me, eleven for him. And I looked at my phone, and there was nothing. And I remember thinking. Oh my God, he's fucking her right now. Like while I'm, while I'm lying here, what am I going to do? And that initial panic and, and, you know, we've all felt jealous and we've all felt that sort of like terror of, Oh my God. And I thought, okay, like I'm going to have to find a way to get through this. I mean, I need to, cause short of like running my head into a wall so that I can render myself unconscious so I can sleep the rest. And I, I got to figure out something. And I, I, had this like little, then I think you've talked about it too, about peeling that onion. Yeah. What are you afraid? And it started there. What are you afraid of? Yeah. Are you afraid that like, he's going to go, Oh no, actually this is the woman for me. So don't bother looking for me when I come back. Right. Kind of thing. No, that's probably not going to happen. You know, it like, and then you peel back and you go, you know what? It's fine. And I remember thinking to myself, he's enjoying himself. He's, you know, he's having fun and he loves you for giving him that and not making him feel like he has to step out into traffic in front of a tractor trailer because it's all good. Right. And, um, and he did message me when he got back and he was like, I don't think, I don't think I want to do this anymore right now. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to play a part. Like, I don't want to, I want to wait till you, cause I was going to join him in a, in a, about a month or something. Yeah, I was going to, and he said, I think I just want to put a hold on this, on playing a part until you, we can be together again and really process this and talk about this and kind of think about where our relationship is going to go next. And, and he said, but, but go on your date. Like, I'm not saying this so that you won't go your, on your date. If you go on your date and you feel differently, I'm totally good. And, um, and I did, and I kind of came to the same conclusion where I was like, I didn't feel guilty, but it just, it wasn't the same. I was like, I, I feel like I'd rather him be there, which kind of even sounded weird in my own head. Right. It's like, I've never, I've never had that happen. So why would I feel that way? But that, that was, and that kind of started where we both kind of shut it down for a few weeks. And, and, you know, there was a lot of like sexy conversations and, and, pictures and stuff we we found ways to kind of stave it off the data connection was so painfully slow where i was she'd send me a picture and she was like did you get it and i'm like no it hasn't (laughs) finished downloading yet and it was like and i'd stare at my phone for like i'm not even kidding you like a good 10 15 minutes watching a little like you know, wheel turn to the full, <laughs> yep. and then I get the picture. I'm like, oh, it was like this was like being twelve and looking for porn on the internet before there was an internet, like on yep. dial on dial up, right? <laughs> yep. And, and going to bed and load. like, yeah, and it's like, oh, nipples, right? And like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so we, yeah, we so, feel you on that. By the way, we yeah. we know what it's like to be in close places. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I mean, it's well, a, yeah. You you've been you know being in in South America, and you're like, come on. 
it's simultaneously amazing and frustrating. Like to, yes. to think the fact that we were like we were like ten thousand miles apart, and yet we could we could communicate as if we were sitting next to each other, mm-hmm. and then yet at the same time, some sexy picture is taking the better part of a day to download <laughs> to my phone, and you're just like, why? Like why? What are you doing to me? <laughs> what is this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then you, I guess, take us through a little bit of the next phase. Okay. So, um, be joined me out where we were and it was amazing. And, and the connection was real. We were a little unsure of, because we were so new before this time apart, would it like with that space, with that temporal and physical space, would we still feel the same way about each other? And we were still crazy about each other. Um, and we had this amazing trip and we came home and now we were in a situation where I was separated and we could explore this relationship together and fully. fully. And so we, we kind of put a pause on, cause we kind of independently decided that we weren't we were interested in playing a part, but we wanted to try and develop our relationship with just two of us before we started, if we were going to do anything else um, in the realm of like kind of non-monogamy and for a couple of months, that's what we did. We just focused on each other. And then B tells me she did a thing. <laughs> and I'm like, So what? I did this thing. Yeah. And it's always fun when she says that because it's always something interesting. And she had had um like through the dating apps. I like, think it was Tinder. It was Tinder, had found like a, a couple that was on Tinder looking for a third, right? As, no. Was or was it looking for another couple? We didn't know. I mean, there's there's apps out there like Field that are designed for this. We didn't know about it at that point yet. So we we're using the kind of standard ones. And that's when we had our conversation. We're like, oh, I mean, we talked about this. Maybe we are ready to 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 do this. And that didn't actually end up panning out because um, she's got a great bullshit filter. And, Thank you. Yeah, no, it's excellent. Yes. And and there were some red flags in the communications and stuff that it didn't look like everybody involved was actually on the same level of interest, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean, mm-hmm. right? Well, yeah, that's uh, never happened to us, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it was so cute when I was like when I was listening to you guys talk about like we're way too nice. Like we're, you know, we we're just kind of like, oh, okay, and you don't want to be and You don't want to pull be the ones that pull the plug. Yeah, and I, I so get that. Like I I like I felt so seen when I when I heard you guys talking about that and how you get better and better at just going mm, something. It just doesn't pass the smell test, right? There's just something you can tell, and you can tell when someone's kind of being dragged along a little mm-hmm. bit, or when maybe it sounds like it's two people, but it's really only one. And yeah, there's just kind of, and when they don't have the language and they don't, when they go, we don't have any rules at all. And you go, mm, I don't know. like, unless, you know, especially when they go, we're new at this, but you know, like you can be our Sherpas. It's like, no, thank you. Um, but they, when they, when they say they have, they just started and they have no rules and every, and it's like, that is just a recipe for disaster. Like you don't, I mean, I d- there's been a few people I think that we've um, connected with that have had a lot less experience than we have. But when when you get people that don't have the language, haven't really been thoughtful about the process at all, we really like to try and stay away from those people. I'm more than happy to like have a drink and have a conversation sure. and talk about it. But as far as actually playing with with people at that stage, I really prefer, we really prefer not to do that because I've been in a room and watched a woman's face change, just drop from everything's cool to, Oh my God, I'm going to, I'm going to implode. And I shut everything down. I, I, I looked at him. I'm like, we're done because it just, I was like, this is just going to go from bad to worse. And we need to stop this right now. And it's just, it's not a good feeling. No, it's not a fun place. And I don't, we never want people to come away feeling hurt or, or ignored or anything like that. So anyway, um, so yeah, the, the, I'm thankful for my bullshit filter. It's, it's been really, really useful for this kind of stuff. Um, but we actually ended up our first experience was with a lesbian couple and they are, they've been together like, what did they just celebrate their 17th anniversary? Yeah, Something like that. A long time. And they're gorgeous. Gorgeous. Both of them. And I, 
I was friends with them, like not like super, super close friends, but we had trained uh, together a little bit at, at a certain point. And I, it was actually a Dan Savage call that gave me the idea because it was this, in his words, gold star lesbian who had never, had never been with a man before. She had ended this really toxic relationship with her girlfriend and she had gone out to a bar and took a guy home. And she was like, Oh my God, like this is, it was amazing. And like, what do I do? And he's like, what do you mean? Like, do it again. What do you mean? What do you do? <laughs> and he said, all this time you thought we're a lesbian, a lesbian. And it turns out you're bi. So, so what? Like Yahtzee. Right. And he said, I know a lot, a lot of um, lesbian couples that share a dick once in a while. And I was like, huh, <laughs> that is an interesting idea. And um, that was kind of, and that was an awesome experience. We had kind of, we had talked about it. It was so cool. There was such a cool charge asking them. And, and, and I, I know you guys talk about Dan Savage. We talk about Dan Savage a lot. A lot of our language comes from him. A lot of, he's so great at giving you the words and giving you the tools and the strategies mm -hmm. to move forward with a lot of this stuff. And, and offering the no, I think is so important when you're, especially like when you're asking your friends to fuck you, like, it's like, <laughs> you know, and, and I have to say, like, we've asked a few and they're always very flattered. Yeah. Aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> um, some of them say yes. Yeah. Um, and they were like, you know what? Um, that sounds cool. We're more interested in playing with you. Um, but you know, he's welcome to like watch and interact with you. And, and I was like, Oh, okay. Well, let me check with him. And I asked you like, so they're really more interested in just playing with me, but you're okay to be there and like be with me. Like, I don't know. Is that okay? And you were like, Hmm, let me think. Uh, um, I get to watch my girlfriend, um, have sex with two, two hot women and I still get to fuck you. I think I'm good. Yeah. It's, it sounded like a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah. What a shitty Friday night. Right. <laughs> And it was, they, oh my God, they were so cute. They both mm -hmm. got their eyelashes done and they made chocolate covered strawberries. And it was like, it was a super, super fun night. And actually each of them ended up letting you go down on them. With, I, I mean, I asked for explicit, con, yeah, explicit, Ex enthusiastic consent because we had, a I'm not a fan of like establishing rules and then just changing them. Like just, ah, it'll be fun. like, no, I was like, Hey, I'd really like to do this thing. Are you like, how's that sound? Would that be all right? And they're like, yeah, like, uh, okay. I'm like, all right, sweet. And that was the first time that I was like, I remember looking over and seeing this happening and like my head was close to her head and I'm like, are you okay? Like, is that, and she goes, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm good. <laughs> and I, that was my first, when you guys, when we talk about compersion, in theory, you think I couldn't even imagine watching my beloved go down on some, on another woman or man <laughs> still okay with that, by the way. I'm just <laughs> All right. Noted. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and in theory, in my head, it was like, I, I can't even imagine that. I can't even imagine that. And then it's happening and you go, Hey, you didn't think they were going to let you do that. Like, look at how, ah! <laughs> and he went to come towards me and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you can have this anytime. This is a limited time. I'll go back over there. Go, go enjoy. And it was such a, we were high for what, like two weeks after yeah, that? It was, it was a bit, yeah. It was such a positive yeah. experience. And it was, there was, there were no negative emotions at all. It was just, it was all, it sounds kind of cheesy, but it was all love. Right. And I actually sat, I, I went and had a coffee with them a couple of weeks later just to kind of debrief. And I was just like, you know, how are you feeling about everything? And like, it was so amazing for us. And they were like, by the way, his oral skills, really nice. And he was so, yeah. <laughs> and he was I mean, so, like, they should know. And he was so happy that it's like, <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, they're experts. Right? Well, I just wanted to make sure that everybody, I mean, I wasn't looking for the compliment, uh, happy to receive the compliment, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody was okay. Right. Like, because again, we had, there was a change of rules on the fly. And even with the consent, I still want, I didn't want people to feel badly afterwards mm -hmm. that they, or feel regret that they had done something that in the moment they thought was cool. But then after the fact and, mm -hmm. you know, and they're friends of, of bees. Right. And, and wanted to make sure that that hadn't 
impacted anything because that's mm. not what wasn't our intention. If it was going to make the friendship weird, then we, we wouldn't want to do that. Right. No. So, so yeah. then we kind of moved forward with, we, we thought, you know, like couples are, and, and again, you guys talked about that too. Like it primarily couples was something that we were interested in because of that. And you're right. It's really hard to find that four way dynamic. Yeah. And um, when you're first starting out, you think um, you take that, that 60% and you round it up to a hundred and then you go, yeah, we probably shouldn't have done that. Um, where you go, because we're not going to get an opportunity. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Don't do it. Yeah, don't rush <laughs> if you're not it. feeling it, if it's, if it's, if it's, it's either fuck yes or no, that's kind of our rule now is fuck yes or no, not uh, no. And, and when Finn, when we were, when I was listening to your first episode, who, your interviewer was great, by the way, from the... Oh, yeah, AJ. Oh, thank you, yeah. He's yeah. amazing. Yeah. He's really, really good. That was a fantastic interview, yeah. When you talked about, like, you know, that the four-way chemistry in the terms of, like, you know, if the guys aren't going to play together, you still want to ha- you still want to like them and, and respect them and know that they're going to be good to your partner. I, I feel, like, when I was thinking, I was like... He, like get on my head, man. Like this is the exact same sort of thing. And yeah. when we talk about that four way chemistry, I'm not interested in playing with the other guy, but I want to make sure that he's a good dude. Right. And that he's going to treat B right. And that everybody is on the same page in terms of like interest in each other and, and desire to make this a, a super fun, mm-hmm. awesome experience. Yeah. yeah so Although, it was for the record, B is okay with it. If you do. Oh uh, yeah, fine. no, I'm, I'm totally I, fine. She's with totally it. fine. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. Um, it, it and we actually kind of, I think we kind of went um, the opposite way that a lot of, I find a lot of people will kind of start out with threesomes and that was something that I was a little bit more trepidatious about I felt more comfortable with with couples because there's an established relationship there and um, I don't know if you've experienced this but sometimes you would um, come across people on the apps that are like well it's me and like a friends with benefits that I play with. And I was kind of like, mm, that wasn't, we would tend to stay, uh, stay away from that because I think part of what makes the chemistry work is, um, vibing with the other person, the other couple's relationship and seeing what that relationship is like and going, Oh, look, like they're such a great couple. Yeah, like it. Yeah. And, and I think that was seeing that affection, like a, a genuine affection yeah. in another couple and, and the, like it's coming from the right kind of place mm-hmm. that they're doing this. And Not to be judgy, but, no. it, but it was just it, for us, that was what yeah. we really vibed with and felt comfortable with. And so I was a little bit more trepidatious about the threesome because it's like, Oh, then, you know, and so it was another, probably a year, mm-hmm. um, before we, we, we did that. And, um, that was actually way better than I thought it would be. Th- we okay. had a threesome. We had a threesome with another woman, um, that actually he found on Bumble, met on Bumble, not found. It's, they're not Easter eggs, but, kind um, of. they're people. <laughs> and, Inside of Easter eggs. And he actually, um, had a, a coffee date to meet her that I couldn't go on. So you know how you were talking about like, you don't do things apart unless like, like one of you is traveling or, or is unavailable. And in that case I was unavailable and there was that weird feeling again. Like I remember going to jujitsu class and telling a girlfriend of mine, like, so he's on a date right now. Like, I'm, ah, like I, I, we like talk to me about something else, even though I knew nothing was going to happen because it was basically like a setup for the three of us. Um, it was still, it had been, it was the first time in a long time where we had sort of done anything like that separately. And I was like, Ooh, I don't know how I, Ooh, I don't know how I feel about that, but it worked out. It worked out great. And she, um, she was awesome. And we, we all met for dinner and, and she said a really, she said something to me. He had shit happens when people goes to, when people go to the bathroom, you know what I mean? That's where, that's where everything gets like, all right, he's gone. We're going to talk about this. All right. She's gone. We're going to talk about this. And he had gone and she said to me, the only reason I'm considering this is because of the way he talks about you and about your relationship. And it told me so much about who he is and what you guys are. This like, cause she'd never done 
No, she never done she'd never been with a woman before and she'd never done a threesome before. And she was, she said, the only reason that I'm entertaining this is because of what you guys are together and how he talked about you on our coffee date. And I just, I think when people are, are good, giving into their fears about non-monogamy, I think they imagine that there's always something going on, something negative going on behind your back. Right. And when you, when you have somebody say something like that to you and you, you understand that no, like they're big fans of yours and they're telling other people how great you are. And, and, and that's part of it. And I think you talked about this too, is that when you finally understand that your partner has your best interest at heart and has your relationship in such highest, holding it in such high esteem, then that takes a lot of the fear and the jealousy mm-hmm. and the negative emotions out of it. But that mm-hmm. takes time, right? Yeah. It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also think it's really fascinating. And this isn't like calling you out on bullshit or anything. It's just that I think it's fascinating that you two have both gone through so many transformations of you've been the person cheating. You've, you've found that that didn't mean you love that person less or you love this new person and you've been the friends with benefits and you've been the friends with benefits who are seeking outside partners and you've done all of this. There's been a lot of dynamics. Right. And what, (laughs) and what you've come to is almost like, well, that thing we were, that's not what we like now that we're looking for it together. Like it's, it's just an interesting sort of contrast of like now we would like to meet other couples who are somewhat established because we'd like to see their dynamic between the two of them and and again you can find whatever you want and you can look for whatever you want there's no no judgment because i'm sure there's people out there who are like well we prefer to meet people who are just friends with benefits because we don't want it to be serious and we don't want to get to know them mm-hmm. and everybody has their own thing i just i just thought it was so fascinating that like you had been almost like every role along the way <laughs> between the two <laughs> between of the you. two of you mm-hmm. yeah. and and then you're like but we don't really like that so much i mean it's okay it's great but like we like this other thing we'll go to coffee with them but we'd prefer if we're going to take it further than that and i just i think it's i think it's really fascinating and i love it but you're also open to having it continue to evolve and change yeah. that's yeah. and i and i think that's the other thing too is that you know something else that that we had in common was you know everything is on the table everything's up for discussion and we've acknowledged and we know that what our relationship looks like right now may not be what it looks like a year from now or five years from now, or we don't know. And it's funny before COVID hit, we were actually um, in Costa Rica for Christmas and new years. And we were driving from, um, from one locale that we were staying to another one. And it was like, what do we want this year to look like? Like, how do we, what do we want our relationship to look like this year? How, what are things that, do we have any goals? Are there things? And how many people have that conversation about what do we want our relationship to look like now? Where is it going? And we had talked about, you know, we would really like for this to be a tribe building year, you know, where we, we find people that, because we're not like finding people is difficult. So let's put the work in to find people that we can have connections with when you guys were talking about, and we have barbecues and we do all this stuff because you want people that you can, you know, I don't want to be constantly looking for people. We're all busy. We all have all kinds of facets to our lives where it's like, it would just be nice to have, um, like a tribe of people that you trusted, that you liked, that you had connections with, that you appreciated as people, whether you're having sex with them or not. And, and that was kind of, but, and then COVID hit and just blew that yeah, all to shit. Yeah, but, well, but it takes, pa- it takes patience to build that. Too. Well, I was going like, to say, you're, you're okay doing the work. You just don't want to do the work every time you want to meet somebody. You have to start with a blank slate. And I think that's, a, yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. It was never so, about quantity. No. It was about quality of experience with us. And I think it's because we're at a point in our relationship where we're not afraid of emotional connections with other people. Like I know there, there's a couple that we play with and I know like him and the other woman have so much in common. And that was so evident from the first time we met with them. Um, and it was really, you know, that is something that I think in regular monogamous life. I don't even know what you call it. I don't know. Straight vanilla. I don't know. Um, 
that would feel threatening, you know, when, when, you know, some woman or has so much in common with your partner and they're talking all night or vice versa. And you think, um, I'm going to have to do something about that. Or somebody will even walk up and go, you might want to do something about that because there's something happening there. And there's just, all of that is, is removed. And you are like, how cool is that, that you guys have so much in common? We didn't know that when we, when we matched with them, what that relationship would be like. And, and it's such a, it's a really hard feeling to describe unless and until you experience it yourself of that. Yeah. You know, these are people that we can vibe with that we can, like you said, put in the work to have more of a longer term relationship that builds over time. And, you don't have to talk all the time. Like we didn't talk for a couple, a couple of months while we were all on lockdown and all that kind of stuff. And then when things started to loosen up, we were talking again and, and it, and it's, it's great, but I, but yeah, putting in the work is important because it's, it's worth it. It's worth it when you can find people that you have that connection with and that trust with and that chemistry yeah. with. Yeah. yeah. So, And I guess I was just going to say, I guess that kind of brings to, can you guys describe where you're at today and kind of what you see moving forward? So where we're at today, we are still in an open ish relationship. Monogamish. Monogamish relationship. Um, we still play with other people. Um, COVID has changed venues and abilities to do this kind of stuff. So um, we're not, we're working on our tribe as opposed to it expanding the tribe right the, and the stable yeah the tribe versus the stable <laughs> that's right tribe sounds so much nicer it, yeah um and moving forward we're just i mean our relationship continues to evolve um we communication is such an important part of having a relationship of this type i mean i think communication in any relationship is super important and i think people who are not in a non-monogamous relationship could still benefit from the communication skills that, that, that you have to develop if you want to do non-monogamy successfully. Um, there was our government here, um, <laughs> when they talked about opening things up, um, over the summer and COVID, they talked about bubbles and they talked about, about, um, you know, create a bubble of people that you can trust and, you know, to expand your social circle. And then there was all this talk about like, what is somebody going to say if like we asked them to be in our bubble and they say no? And like, and we're like, these are all communication skills. Like we have, you know, you have awkward conversations with people. You know, it's always a policy of ours that when, when we're going to, if we're going to, if we've gotten to a point where we're going to, to, to have sex with another couple, we talk about STI testing and history and status and all that kind of stuff. Um, not to be judgy or shamey, just to have make, make sure everybody is making informed consent on on whatever and boundaries and all that kind of stuff. So there's this communication skill that's already there, and we were laughing like you know negotiating bubbles is kind of like negotiating sex in terms of yeah. like, when was the last <laughs> time you were tested? And yeah. Are there any statuses we need? Are to you be seeing with? anyone else? Yeah. Like, and we, yeah. Are you in anyone else's bubble? <laughs> How often do you go to the grocery store? <laughs> yes, yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> um, yeah, meeting people has been it's harder now. And I think because of the low level anxiety that we're all feeling with all of this, it's, it's uh, sort of the desire to expand at this point is kind of like blunted. Mm. We're just, we're practicing gratitude for who we have in our life right now. And we're kind of sitting with that right now because it's just, it's, it's really hard to, I mean, every, everybody, it's, it's weird because all over different areas, everything is different because there's different hotspots and there's different places where rules are different, um, as far as gathering and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so we're just kind of, mm, we're just kind of sitting back and just seeing how that goes. It's actually been interesting. I, I think we were both like a little bit concerned about what it would be like when we were just having sex with each other all the time. <laughs> Yeah, because that was the thing. Like, like our neither of us felt that there was anything missing in our in our sexual relationship that we were fulfilling by um, by being with other people. I mean, um, B sexuality. I mean, I can only as a man. There's only so much that I can I can I can meet there. Um, 
Oh, okay. Right, right. Mm-hmm. She knows what I'm talking. <laughs> um, but beyond that, there was like there was nothing else that was that was that was that we were searching for. But it was always a possibility. And then, kind of when March and April hit, and there was no possibility of anything other than the two of us, was that going to change how we felt about about um, each other and and the type of sexual relationship they were having? And I mean, I don't know about other people, but but COVID didn't really tamp down any desire or anything like that with, with us. It was, it was actually unexpected time together with the whole rest of the world kind of shut out in like, it was more time together than we were expecting than, mm-hmm. than less. Right. And so it was an interesting time for us. Well, and I think, yeah, Emma, you said something too in your interview and I was the same thing where I was like, get out of my head that I've literally said the same thing that, it's not always necessarily about doing the things. It's about, it's more about the psychology of you can do those things mm-hmm. where the communication is open. Even something as simple as not getting jealous with appreciating someone that you see on the street or, you know, because that potential is always there because the psychology of openness and the potential for adventure is always there. Even when we are in a sort of monogamous period, you know, monogamous because COVID, Mm -hmm. it doesn't have the same restriction on it. I think in, in your mind, and it's almost like your body knows the difference. (laughs) It's so strange. Like, you know, you think how long, how long would it be before boredom sets in? Does it set in? And and we don't know what that would be like because we've always had that mindset of, yes, we can do those things. All we have to do is have a conversation about it and we can go and move forward and have that adventure. And it's not an extinction level event for our relationship. So I think that's been a really important thing with, with the pandemic and how that's changed sort of non-monogamy and, and, and sex and mm-hmm. meeting people is that psychology is still there, that openness and that communication and that fantasizing is still there. And you can share that with your partner and that kind of keeps things um, in a nice place. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so that's kind of where we're at. We're still, we're always open to meeting people and, and having conversations with people. And I, I, I think, um, yeah, it makes things harder, but we're flexible strategists, right? We all find a way to make things work. You know, yeah. so that's, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I think, I think it's incredible. And I mean, everything you two have talked about for the last well, hour and a half has been amazing. And like, we normally have to ask lots of questions and you've pretty <laughs> much answered, you've pretty much answered most of everything we've ever asked. Like, as, as we've gone. Just as, you've, just as you've been talking about things. So, so yeah. thank you for that. That makes it really easy. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I just, maybe to kind of like wrap up the conversation was curious if, for each of you, like you now have been together, you said roughly three years, known each other like three and a half, four years or so. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is really your each of yours like first successful go at navigating non monogamy. Mm-hmm. How have you seen the other person like grow and change over the last four years as you've been exploring this together? Hmm. What a great question. Mm. Do you want me to go first? Yeah, you go first. Oh, wow. That, that is, that is a great question. When Dante, it's interesting for me because I was able to see Dante in another relationship dynamic and then in our dynamic. And I was able to look at the dynamic he was in before with a little bit of distance and perspective because I wasn't invested in getting him out of that dynamic, if that makes sense. It was just, this is how it is. And I'm on the outside enjoying him when we had the opportunity. But other than that, that was his life. And through the conversations that we've had and some of the things that I've witnessed and over the years watching, watching um, things shift a little bit, I think that there was a lot of shaming of his sexuality within that relationship for lots of different reasons Um, for the things for the drive and for just basically having one mm-hmm. um, and that the, there was always sort of a, a barter system for sex and it sort of commodified sex in that relationship where it was always, well, if I do A, B, C, and D, 
maybe she'll say yes to me. And it was always put on the table. If you did A, B, C, and D, this would happen more. And so there was always this, this kind of dynamic of, well, if I, if I do all my chores and I'm a good boy, maybe I'll be able to express myself sexually. And I always found that like, that, I mean, that's felt a lot like the shame uh, for my sexuality growing up, where it was like, if you're a good girl and you don't like, you're going to, you'll be able to have the husband and the family and you'll be able to be happy. And you know what I mean? Like, and so I, I think I identified a lot with that shame. And so I've watched him within this relationship and, and what we've been able to do. He seems like for him to be able to be honest about what he wants and what his desires are and, and to fully express his sexuality has, has really, um, it's manifested itself in so many different parts of his, of his personality, you know, like even with like you training and stuff like that, you, you know, he's, he trained, he, he put a, he like put a, a home gym in his garage because that was something that was important to him. And it was almost like, it's, you know, um, making choices about, well, I want to be, you know, the best version of me for my partner and any other partners we decide to add. And, and then there seemed to be a lot less stress and anxiety about asking what he wanted or talking about things that he wanted. And I don't know, there just seems to be an ease about those things where, where he feels he feels comfortable expressing that with me. Mm -hmm. And I think for a long time, he felt like he had to hide who he was. And, and that was a big dirty secret, you know, and, um, and not having to do that, I think takes a lot of stress and strain off of a person. And so I've noticed, I've noticed he's just not a lot of, I mean, he's a very positive, you know, ebullient person to begin with. (laughs) But I think that, you know, I've noticed sort of a calmness with him. And I think you kind of talked about like where your sex drive was always like this dragon that was Yeah, it was like a pressure cooker. Yeah. Like it would build up. I would only be able to resist the the urges for so long. And then I would need to like do something and then the whole process would start over again. And that's not a fun way to live when you always are chasing that, no. chasing a dragon. I mean, it sounds like a, it sounds like an addiction. Yeah. And, and I think that's where like that idea of porn addiction and sex, mm. sex addiction come from, but which is a whole other episode. But he, I remember him saying to me at one point, I don't feel that pressure anymore. I don't feel that pressure cooker. I feel like, you know, because, you know, he felt because he could express himself fully with me and within the relationship that we had, that that pressure was gone. Mm. And again, that potential for adventure, for variety, for novelty was being indulged. And at least the conversation was being had. So that changed, you know, it's like they say, you know, if sex isn't a problem in your relationship, it's only 20% of your relationship. If sex is a problem, it's 80% of your relationship. So I think that, you know, when that switches, then it's like, yeah, there's like this ease in this this joy that emerges from like, you know, we have this thing and we can be, you know, you can be who you really are and not Mm -hmm. feel shamed for it. Or like, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a perk, not a bug. That's right. Right. It's a feature. Yeah. Yeah, It's a feature, feature, not a bug. That's right. Feature, not a bug. That's right. That's what I meant. (laughs) That's, that's for like when we used to travel and (laughs) we used to have perks, we don't have perks anymore. (laughs) So yeah, that's what I would say that I've, I've noticed. I've noticed with Dante. Do you have anything to add to that? No, you you got it for sure. But all the talking, nobody asks any questions because we answer all the questions. <laughs> with with B, um, I think the biggest thing that I've noticed through all of this is that, and you talked about it a little bit earlier, B about about like the shame of of what it's like when you feel like you have to turn off a part of you to be. Um, to be acceptable for, you know, whatever the current social norm is, right? So if you were, 
very sexually active and had lots of partners and whatever, and then get married. It's like, Oh, I got to lock that shit down and, you know, stop being such a slut and, and just put it all away. Um, that's definitely, I don't subscribe to that. I think that you should express who you are, do it safely, make sure that everybody's safe and, and may do it consensually. But I don't think that that's a, a huge problem the way it was or the way that people put it on themselves to be like. And one of the things that I found with Beatrice was that through all of this, I felt like she could express who she was fully and not be judged by me. And then also, as we discovered through the course of this, her sexuality has evolved to the point that she's comfortable, eh, mostly, yeah, yeah. with saying that she's bisexual. And that came out. I remember when we were having a conversation on, you know, on the dating apps with somebody and she like said that for the first time. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you said it. Look are, at you. You're like, are you bisexual? And, and, I didn't realize you, you had decided. And, and yeah, that you had decided that, yeah, that's where you are. And I mean, mm. you can all take the Kinsey test and, and, and see where you fall on that scale. But, but. For Beatrice to be able to be like fully honest and open with who she is and, and what she desires and know that I, as her partner, fully support her and have her back on, on everything again, takes away that like, okay, like I have to lead different lives. Like with this person, I, I present this way and then I need to lock these parts of me up because that's not part of like that relationship. And, and it's exhausting to try to figure out who you are with different people and to just be able to be completely open and honest about who you are and what you desire and where you want to be and what you want your relationship to look like. Again, like creates that ease that, that B was talking about where you just aren't dealing with that that pressure or that stress anymore about how do I make sure I present the right version of me for this particular situation. And, you know, like, I don't want to say that we never have issues and we never have rough days because there's some rough days. There's, there are times where you're, you know, um, things get misunderstood and mm -hmm. maybe your communication isn't, you know, on point that day. So yeah, not everything is like, it's not sunshine. All sunshine. no, it's not sunshine and rainbows. And you know that, and anybody who's done this for any amount of time knows that too. But I would say there is such a joy in this relationship. Um, because, you know, I, I always remember there being, you know, anxieties and wondering and suspicions and with, with all the other relationships I've ever been in, because you don't ask because you don't have the, you don't have the words or you don't have the guts or you don't have whatever it is. And with this kind of relationship, that's not an option. You need to, you find the courage to move forward and to ask the questions that you need to ask and to get the answers that you need and to express the things that you need to express. And when you find someone who doesn't punish you for saying what you want or who you are or what you need. Mm -hmm. There's such a joy around that. And I, I think if somebody would, if somebody asked me, how would you describe your relationship? I would say joyful. Yeah. Like there's just, you know, you're just a delight. Oh, I'm going to bring you everywhere. Bring me everywhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and yeah, I think, I think, and I'm sure Emma, you can agree with me. Like, as a woman, it's so hard to navigate that, that sh sexuality, shame, duality, and that, you know, we're supposed to be sexual, but we can't have had too many partners because that's a problem. And oh, yeah. Like, I mean, how, I don't know. I mean, again, that's another. You, you, and I should, you and I should have our own episode <laughs> and we'll talk about how women can't win ever. Um, but, but to find a partner and, and, and you've, you've found that too. And, and it's so cool that you guys found yourselves so young and found each other so young. You didn't even realize what you'd found, but to, to find Dante at this point in my life and, and be able to have that is just such a gift, I think. And so I think that, you know, um, and yeah, you can be like, Oh, I wish we'd met younger, but it would have changed a lot of things. So I'm yeah, you yeah. wouldn't be who you are today. No, that's if it. That had happened. That's exactly it. Like you are the sum of your experiences. Mm. And, and we were at like, if I'd met her 15 years ago, I wouldn't be, 
it wouldn't be the same person and yeah. uh, and and she wouldn't have been the same person yeah. so we just are, are grateful for the time that that we've had together and and for what the rest of our life together looks like well i'm gonna live forever you so. will live forever <laughs> i think so <laughs> I'm the one that's got to catch up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a wonderful place to yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been an incredible conversation, and we thank you both. For, and we could probably talk for many more hours. Many more but hours. for the sake of time. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I mean, yeah. Thank you for sharing everything for the wonderful wisdom um, and experiences that you've shared with us. We really appreciate it, and I'm sure we will have you back on at some point to talk more about how things progress because it doesn't sound like it's going to stop anytime like soon. There's going to be more. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See how many roles we can play. In this. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you for having us. It, it's, it's been, it's been so great to, it's been to awesome. speak with you and, and tell our story. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so great that you're, you're doing this, this podcast because I think, I think it helps a lot of people mm-hmm. to hear a variety of different stories and people are going to resonate with so many different stories and different parts of different stories. And I think it's really important what you guys are doing because um, it really does help people, I think to, to go, Oh yeah, me too. So, so thank you for doing what you're doing. I think that's awesome. And, and uh, we're going to have to have you guys on. Yes. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for the very sweet words. We yeah, appreciate thank it. You so and much. It's, it's just, it's so nice to, it's, I mean, this is why we did it right. To help people and yeah. spread stories and it just, Thank you so much for the kind words, for listening, and for um, sharing your own. So, yeah, we really appreciate it. And and maybe with that, we'll let you get along with your afternoon. It's a little later there, as <laughs> I messed up earlier in the interview. Um, <laughs> it is later there than it is here, so we'll let you go <laughs> and enjoy, and we will uh, keep in touch. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye. And we're back. We hope you enjoyed that fantastic conversation with Beatrice and Dante. We had a wonderful time and actually we spent one Saturday talking to them for like six hours. So. Yeah. So if you want to hear the other half of that, head over to their show and listen to last week's episode from December 2nd and you'll hear them interviewing us. Yes. And they also have a lot of other fantastic episodes. They've started their podcast back in July. So go back and listen to some of those as well. Yes. And thank you so much for coming on the show. We're so excited to promote and share the love. Yeah. So uh, as we mentioned in the intro, we're just going to quickly explain really quick what this Patreon thing is about in case you are looking for community. Maybe the world is shutting down around you. You don't have any friends that you can hang out with, or maybe you just don't have any like people like us to talk with. So the Patreon community is a really great place to find that. Um, you don't have to be non-monogamous in any way, shape, or form. It is just a group of open-minded people actually there are some people in there who aren't non-monogamous yes that's and, true and they're super active and it's a great sort of support group for them as well so the q a's that we do every month are really just not even a q a we probably need to rename them they're really more of just a discussion group and a time for the community to come together hang out uh, help each other find support tell stories whatever it is and so the that next one is coming up on the 16th which would be next Wednesday. Yep. We do one at 9 p.m. Eastern and again, another one at 9 p.m. Pacific. You can both join either one or both of them. And to learn about where to do this, just again, head over to our website or the show notes. There's links there as well at normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the Patreon tab and you will be on your way to being part of one of the greatest uh, online communities in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. And I'm humble. And don't forget, our next meet and greet is this coming Saturday, the 12th. Now, the meet and greets are separate from the Patreon um, events, so anyone can join. It's just $10. Go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the meet and greet tab to sign up. And next week, we have an interview. (laughs) Wouldn't you know it? Yeah, another interview. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. With Kristen. She is here on behalf of her little polycule. Yep. And it's a wonderful story, and little fun one so we're super excited to get that out there we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week we'll see you this weekend obviously we'll see you on saturday for the meet and greet all of you then we'll see you back here for another episode next wednesday yeah bye everyone thanks for listening